grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus has won salvation for us. He began reconciling God and man when he came in the flesh and united the divine nature and human nature within his own person. He then took up our sins, carried them to the cross, and at his crucifixion covered them with his blood, wiping away all sin. After dying, Jesus rose from the dead, restoring to us the hope of everlasting life. And then Jesus ascended into heaven, forever bringing human flesh into the Father's presence as a sure and certain sign that he has reconciled us to God and saved us. The work of saving mankind is done. And yet, if this salvation were not made known to us, it would not benefit us in the least. Imagine if you commissioned an artist to paint a beautiful picture, and the artist slaved away at the painting, often skipping meals and staying up late into the night, making special brushes and mixing oils and pigments so that every stroke would be perfect and every color as vivid as life. And then imagine that the painting is never delivered. You never see it. What happens to all the artist's toil and time? It was all in vain. Nothing. So also, if Jesus had won salvation for us, but it was never published and proclaimed, no one would receive the benefits of that salvation, and his work would have been for nothing. Today is Pentecost, and we reflect on the coming of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the one who has acquired salvation for us. Jesus is the one who acquired it. The Holy Spirit is the one who delivers it to us. As Jesus said of the Holy Spirit in John chapter 16, He will glorify me for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the significance of Pentecost. The coming of the Holy Spirit marks the beginning of the delivery of salvation. We heard how this started in Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. The disciples had been staying together in an upper room in Jerusalem, and they were devoting themselves to prayer. They had not, up to this point, been publicly preaching or teaching, but were simply awaiting the coming of the Holy Spirit, as Jesus had promised. And then, finally, 50 days after Good Friday, 10 days after Jesus had ascended into heaven, the Holy Spirit came. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, that is, other languages, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Jerusalem was at this time full of pilgrims who had journeyed from all over the world to be at the temple for Pentecost, which in the Old Testament is called the Feast of Weeks. Practically speaking, this was a very opportune time for the Holy Spirit to come, as the apostles could make disciples of all nations without even having to leave the city. And people from all nations end up saying, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. But the timing of the Holy Spirit's coming also points to the fulfillment of certain events from the Old Testament. 
The Lord brought the people of Israel out of Egypt on the first Passover. And 50 days later, they arrived at Mount Sinai, where the Lord gave Moses the law of God. When Moses was coming down the mountain with the stone tablets in hand, he saw the Israelites <coughs> worshiping a golden calf. And on that day, 3,000 of the Israelites were killed. But now, 50 days after Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. We find ourselves at Mount Zion, where God is not giving tablets of stone, but the Holy Spirit. And instead of 3,000 people being killed, 3,000 are baptized and added to the church. The death that was dealt at Mount Sinai is surpassed by the salvation given at Mount Zion, Jerusalem. God shows that he desires our life, not our destruction, as we have long known from the prophet Ezekiel, for instance. As I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? Yes, the Lord desires our salvation. But note that he doesn't save us by calling our evil ways good. He doesn't save us by pretending that sin isn't sin. Instead, the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sins. But he does it in order that he may forgive our sins. This means that the Holy Spirit continues to work through the deadly law that was given at Mount Sinai. But he only kills us with the law so that he can raise us to life by the gospel of Jesus Christ. <coughs> Picture a man who goes in to the doctor for a heart replacement. The surgeon lays him out on the table, and as the man is lying there and the doctor's making preparations, the man glances over and sees all the scalpels, and saws, and pliers, and clamps, and his eyes get wide. He asks the doctor, what are you going to do with those? And the doctor nonchalantly says, I'm going to cut you open. That's going to hurt. Yes, very much so. But what sort of cruel man are you who does these sorts of things to people? And many people wonder the same thing about God, who cuts us to the heart with his law. Is it cruel to save your life? The doctor asks. It may seem strange that I cause you pain. It may appear improper that I give you wounds when, as a physician, my purpose is to heal. But I must do this strange and improper work in order that I might do my proper work. How shall I give you a new heart without removing your old one? Or shall I call your bad heart good just so that I don't have to cut you? How Unloving would that be, to deceive you in that way, and send you off to die. I do not enjoy causing you pain or wounding you, but I will do this improper work for your good, that I may save your life. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit did this strange work of cutting with the law. You heard the beginning of Peter's sermon in the reading, and he continues preaching from there. He testifies and quotes the scripture showing that Jesus is the Christ. And then through the preaching of Peter, the Holy Spirit shows the people their sin. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Who caused Jesus' crucifixion? 
You might say, well, the Romans did, who picked up hammer and nails and put them on the cross. Or you might say, the Jews did, who called for the death of their own Messiah. But neither of those is the answer that the Holy Spirit gives in the Pentecost sermon. Who crucified Jesus? The Holy Spirit gives the answer, you did. Your sins stirred up the wrath of God. Your transgressions drove the nails into Jesus' hands and feet. This Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? When the Holy Spirit does this strange work of cutting to the heart, it feels like death itself has swept over us, and we have sunk down into the bowels of hell. But the Holy Spirit does not leave us there to despair. He does not abandon and forsake us to crawl our own way out, as if we could crawl our own way out. No, the Holy Spirit is just now getting to his proper work. The true reason why the Father and the Son sent him. The Holy Spirit now does his work of delivering the salvation that Jesus has won. The Holy Spirit preaches through Peter. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, and for your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. The Holy Spirit preaches Jesus as the Savior from sin. Yes, it was your sin that put him on the cross, but Jesus is the one who willingly bore that sin in order to forgive your sin. Now you have been baptized in his name. All of your sins are washed away. And you have received the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has glorified Jesus by taking what belongs to him and declaring it to you, just as he did at that great Pentecost. And how does the Holy Spirit continue to do his work today? The same way he did at Pentecost, through the Word and through the sacraments. The Holy Spirit works through means that we can perceive with our senses. We have heard the proclamation of the gospel with our ears. We have felt the water of baptism on our skin. We taste the sacrament of the altar with our tongues. Through the word of God, baptism, confession, the sacrament of the altar, the Holy Spirit continues to do his proper work of delivering salvation to us. Now for centuries, people have argued, you can't limit the Holy Spirit's work to the word and sacraments. That's putting God in a box. The Holy Spirit doesn't need physical means in order to do his work. We can experience the Holy Spirit directly without an oral word, without the water of baptism, without the bread and wine in the Lord's Supper. Are we limiting the Holy Spirit if we say that he only does his work through the word and sacraments? Not at all. Not in the least. The Holy Spirit himself is the one who chose to work through the preached word on the day of Pentecost. It was not a decision of man but of God that the Holy Spirit would be given through holy baptism. God has shown that he does not want to deal with us except by means of an external word and sacrament. In fact, anything that claims to be of the Spirit, apart from such a word and sacrament, is, in fact, of the devil. Therefore, we have not confined God to the word and sacraments. He has put himself there. 
so that we may know where to find the Holy Spirit and thereby receive the grace and salvation of Christ. And so on this day of Pentecost, we seek the Holy Spirit where he has promised to be found. You have already been baptized in Christ's name and received the Holy Spirit. You have this morning heard the word of absolution. You have now received the Spirit's preaching and you prepare yourselves to receive the sacrament of the altar. In all of these, the Holy Spirit delivers to you the salvation that Jesus has won. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding guards your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus.